I wanted to start out with saying, um, yesterday you heard from Dr. Kissinger in the same place. He described the US and China as being in the foothills of a new Cold War. When it comes to 5G technology, however, I think it's fair to say that they're sort of out of the foothills and somewhere up in the mountains, I guess, uh, with the US in particular having taken a number of concrete steps to curb what it sees as a threat emanating from China on this very subject. Now, at the same time, 5G does have the potential to level the information technology playing field, particularly between the developed and the developing world. It's supposed to be the thing that powers lots of new technologies. Again, some of them have been discussed on this stage by no less than Bill Gates yesterday. Things like AI, smart cities, self-driving cars. 5G is supposed to be the connective tissue between all these visions of the future. So how did 5G become so politicized? And how can we actually move forward from here? And does that politicization affect its potential? We're going to discuss all this in less than 25 minutes, so wish us luck. Uh, Nandan, I wanted to start with you. Does 5G live up to the hype? I just described a lot of use cases for it, but what actually changes in the world when someone can download high-definition movies in seconds rather than minutes? Well, I think uh, 5G is a technology that is, in some sense, we are still waiting to see what's the compelling applications for it. I mean, we hear a lot of stuff. AI, IoT, automotive, autonomous vehicles, and all that. But all previous generations of uh, telecom technology had a natural use. When you had 2G and feature phones, then 3G coincided with the rise of the smartphone. That took off a lot. And then 4G coincided with video on, on phones, and people watching Netflix, YouTube, or Hotstar on the phone. So there was a natural application of those technologies. The thing with uh, 5G is that it will require people to build all these functionality for different industries, healthcare, education, financial services. So I think there's a timing issue as to when you roll this out mm -hmm. and when you make money from it. So to me, that's a bigger issue in some sense than the choice of technologies. We're definitely going to get to that. But before we do, Sanjay, give us a snapshot of how important 5G is to your business, which is hardware, semiconductors. You've talked before about how this will lead to basically a multi-year refresh of smartphones. Absolutely. 5G is an exciting opportunity. 5G is not evolutionary like the previous mobile standards. 5G is transformative. And 5G is not just about smartphones. 5G is going to be about billions of connected devices at the edge. 5G makes things faster. It has low latency. It has high bandwidth, which means it enables you to connect billions of devices and still provide good, fast experience, good, fast communication. So what that will do is it will unleash billions of intelligent devices, the kinds that we have not yet seen, on the edge. And these devices will all be connected with each other. They'll be able to talk to each other fast. And they will create a lot of data. Today, a lot of data gets created, but only 2% of that data actually gets used. With 5G enabling low latency, high performance, fast, vast connectivity, it will really enable data to be really tapped into. It will fuel AI. And what that all means is, where does data live after all? Data lives in the kind of product that Micron makes. Micron's flash memory is used to access data fast. Micron's DRAM is used to process data fast. So 5G is going to be, as I said before, multi-year cycle in terms of driving growth in the semiconductor industry and a driver of growth for memory and storage let me just give you one example, smartphones that were announced in February of 2019 at Mobile World Congress. These smartphones, 5G smartphones, had terabyte of flash in them, you know, easily double, if not more, of the high-end smartphones in the market. These phones had even 12 gigabyte of DRAM content in them. And why do you need so much DRAM content in the smartphones? Because 5G, because of its fast connectivity, will actually allow you to have multiple 4K video streams coming into your phone. And you can watch a concert or 
a game from a stadium, broadcast from multiple angles. You can watch those multiple 4K video streams in your phone or a concert in your phone and see it from multiple angles, angle of your choice. You can customize your experience. So now imagine all that 4K video stream coming into the phone, it needs to be processed fast. It needs more memory inside the phone. That's why at Mobile World Congress, when smartphones were announced with 5G, there were phones announced with 8 gigabyte of DRAM, 12 gigabyte of DRAM. This is easily more than double of the standard smartphones you have in the market. So for our business, as, a, as world's leading manufacturer of memory and storage semiconductor solutions, this is a huge growth opportunity. Next year alone, 200 million smartphones are supposed to be sold worldwide in 5G. So this is just the start, and it will drive a long-term refresh cycles in smartphones uh, because it will really give a new kind of experience to the consumers worldwide. And for us, it will drive a growth in great content for DRAM and Flash as well. And 5G is not just about smartphones, it's about machine-to-machine -machine communication as well. So all these applications from data center to smartphone to autonomous to automotive, it all needs more content, more memory, more storage. Therefore, it is, I believe, going to drive a tremendous secular growth trend for our business. Mm. But the important thing for everyone in the audience is we all have to buy new phones, of course. To you will. You will be compelled by the experience <laughs> that those phones will offer. Okay. Um, Li Shui, I wanted to ask you, uh, we talk a lot about uh, 5G leveling the playing field in IT, information technology, especially between developed and developing markets. Can it do this? What does 5G mean for China specifically? Just now, uh, the moderator talked about the 5G technologies. Now it seems that information technology represented by 5G has already come in 2019, we regard this year as the inaugural year of 5G. For China, what it means? In China, there are a lot of uh, traditional industries and also advanced 5G equipment manufacturers. ZTE is one of them. When 5G comes to the Chinese market, an explosive application of 5G will inevitably need to a change, a fundamental change of our industries in all aspects. And also, the supply chain for the 5G, 5G including the upper stream and the lower stream um, supply chain, will also gone through changes. Such application may not be very clear at present, but from zero to one or other applications that we may not imagine now, I believe that the demand is there. So now for equipment supplier, operators, and uh, the clients, I think we need to integrate with each other in the exploration for the vertical application of 5G technologies. So as to prepare for the um, um, explosive application of 5G technologies. Thank you. Uh, Nandan, I wanted to turn to you. Uh, the thorny issue that I alluded to with our intro was, of course, the politicization of what, it, in some respects, seems almost like an innocent technology, correct? So how did we get to this point? Why has this 5G technology become such a hot topic uh, among politicians? Well, I think if you see 5G as the next strategic frontier of telecommunication, and if you believe that it's going to drive a new cycle of growth and it's going to come up with very diverse applications in many industries, then the building blocks of that, where do they come from, become more and more important. And I think the current issue between the US and China and so on, I think who, who are the suppliers, uh, whom does the network buy it from become very important. So. 
basically what we will see is, uh, I think, in areas where the U.S. has influence, it will be driven by, you know, firms like Ericsson and, and Nokia. Uh, in areas where the China has influence, it will be driven by Huawei. And countries, and some countries will do both. They will, they will choose from both. So I think uh, we will see that happening. And a lot of it is also uh, the quality, the technology, the cost involved. Because for if you put on the hat of a mobile operator, uh, they'll have to spend billions of dollars on these networks. They have to, first of all, buy spectrum, which could be expensive. And then they have to buy the equipment. So they need to keep the cost down. And secondly, as I explained in the earlier iterations of telecom, see, normally what happens if you're a telecom uh, you know, network provider, you, you have a cycle of about eight to 10 years per cycle of technology, and you make money in the first few years, because mm. that's when you roll it out, you have competitive advantage, you can charge higher uh, ARPUs, revenue per user, and so on, and then it gets commoditized, and right. the next cycle starts. And in earlier, this is my point, in earlier cycles of generations of this, the obvious users were there. So they could ramp it up in the very first four years. I see the challenge here as how do you quickly build the apps? Because this is an application story. It's not a tech story. It's an app story. How do you apply it for healthcare, entertainment, this, that, all these things? And do it fast enough to be able to get customers to pay for it early in the cycle. So it's a timing issue. Mm -hmm. For example, just uh, yesterday, Verizon announced a deal with Snap, which is the instant messaging so software where they're going to offer augmented reality on 5G in a Snap product. So you're going to see more and more of these, uh, you know, places where application providers work with the... Mm -hmm. But getting that working fast so that you recoup your investment is going to be the heart of this issue. And Sanjay, you're based in the U.S., so you have a sort of front row seat toward, to this politicization issue. What have you observed? So what I would say is that, you know, 5G because of fast access to data and great connectivity, is going to be foundational platform for very many verticals and technologies of the future. Mm. 5G is going to be about leadership, not only in telecommunications, but it is going to be about leadership with AI and connectivity and use of data to really drive deep insights to unleash not only consumer experiences, but new businesses. 5G is going to be foundational platform for smart factories, smart cities, smart government, smart defense of the countries. And that's why it is very important for the countries, for the leading countries, absolutely, it's easy to understand mm -hmm. why there is race toward deploying 5G mm. across all parts of life, business, government, etc. And that's why I think, you know, there is interest in making sure that there is leadership in 5G, whether in China, whether in US, mm -hmm. as well as all around the globe. I want to talk about that, but before we do, I wanted to ask Li Zixue. I heard there was a slogan in China that touches on this race issue. In 2G, we followed. In 3G, we caught up. In 4G, we ran head to head. In 5G, we will lead. How important is the 5G race for China's national psyche? How is it actually playing here to a domestic audience? For Chinese people, 5G is also a new information technology. It means the advent of new industrial revolution. The first and second industrial revolution is represented by the uh, br breakthrough in energy. And the third and fourth is represented by information technologies. The changes that have taken place is obvious. For example, at this forum, I see that for young people and old participants, senior participants, when we meet each other, we found that uh, we are uh, connecting with each other with a WeChat address. What does that mean? It means that uh, the um, information technology revolution has uh, changed people's life, way of life. The changes that 5G will bring to the people is also foreseeable or expected. It includes big data, 
and uh, intelligent, artificial intelligence, and the edge uh, computing and uh, cloud computing. It brings changes in the transfer of information and uh, the uh, computing of uh, inf information. I believe that the vertical application will also see tremendous transformation. What it means to the Chinese people in their psyche for a supplier of equipment, for me, we should embrace these technologies with an open and cooperative mentality to see a win-win cooperation, to say that we should be open. I mean that the world is uh, connected with each other only with an open mentality and uh, build your competitiveness in open environment. Can you survive in this competitive environment. And cooperation, of course, involves interests of uh, all parties. If for equipment provider, I have my users and operators. So for an um, equipment provider like me, we have to work with the U.S. And uh, this kind of cooperation, of course, is based on the interests of each party involved. And uh, when talking about win-win results, it means that all parties will enjoy values gener generated. For equipment producer, we bring value for the users. And at the same time, I would also choose competitive products and competitive parts and materials to develop my IT equipment and systems equipment and the competitive edge in those equi equipments. So against such a large environment, on the one hand, we should be open and we should cooperate with each other and we should seek women outcomes. And more importantly, all um, players in this sector should trust each other. ZTE now has a new vision. That is, we hope that connection and trust is everywhere. Thank you. I think we all hope that. Uh, Sanjay, I wanted to uh, get back to you. From your perspective, again, hardware, semiconductors, does it matter who takes the lead, the US or China, when it comes to 5G? How are you viewing that competition? I think Micron is a very global company. We are a 40-year-old company, um, very innovative company, more than 40,000 patents over the course of 40 years. We are a well diversified company in terms of our customers, in terms of end markets, in terms of end markets supplying from data center to PCs to smartphones to consumer to industrial. In terms of uh, diversification, our customers are across the globe. China is a very important market for us. Our customers here are very valued partners to us. Our supply chain is very well diversified across the globe as well. So as far as we are concerned, and you know, not just memory and storage, not just Micron, but the semiconductor industry. It's very important for semiconductor industry to get the full benefit of scale mm. of global opportunities. And of course, the large market in China, along with the large market in US and in the rest of the world as well, provides a large scale because semiconductors need large capex investments, absolutely cutting edge R&D, research and development, that takes several years to develop new technologies to bring them to production. So a lot of R&D spent. To get the return on those investments, you need the full benefit of scale, mm. and you need the full benefit of engagement with leading partners across the globe in terms of bringing the full value of our innovation at Micron to the benefit of the customers across the globe. Mm. So it's important for us to support innovation in a very free manner across the globe, and of course in a fair manner, mm -hmm. consistent with global principles of level playing field, whether it is in China or it is in US or the rest of the world. So all these markets are extremely important, and the customers driving innovation are absolutely key partners for a company like Micron. Nandan, I'm relying on you to bring us the India perspective. I'm curious how India fits into these tensions between 5G suppliers. Are you going to choose one side or the other? Well, I think that's still uh, up 
up in the air. And right now, our telecom industry in India is going through major changes. Uh, uh, they're faced with uh, high taxes and so on. So they are actually dealing with more short-term issues. And I think uh, we still haven't had the 5G license auctions yet. So I think 5G in India is, is still some time away. And also there's the whole issue of what are the applications. I personally feel uh, that the US is going to be a great place for 5G. Mm. And there's a historical reason for that. When, when AT&T uh, did the consent decree with the Justice Department you know, 20 years back, they essentially had the divestiture where they had the bell operator, they, they had the long distance company and seven so-called baby bells. And each baby bell had a physical footprint. So 9X was the baby bell in New England and Pacific Bell in California. And over time, uh, they all combined into two companies. So Verizon owns half of those older baby bells and AT&T the other. But what happened is that each of these companies now have a physical footprint of fiber and they could not enter into the markets of the other because it's quite expensive to lay fiber to the home. But what 5G does, it gives you fixed wireless. It allows you actually to go to the home and offer wireless with the same fiber kind of capability. So now you see uh, you know, each of them challenging the other in their territories. Uh, you know, Verizon is leading, they're already in eight cities in the US. So fixed wireless, which is a very US specific requirement, I think will drive massive 5G in the US. And that's a very immediate need which will generate a lot of revenues for the telcos. So I see fixed wireless in the US. Not all this newfangled stuff, you know, autonomous cars, all that is great, but fundamentally fixed wireless will drive US consumption. And I think US will actually be a leader in uh, 5G. Hmm. Okay. Oh yeah. Um U.S. as a leader in 5G. Uh, how much of that is down to potentially an uneven regulatory playing field? And um, I'd, I'd really like to get Lee Zishui's comments on this. We have seen the U.S. express security concerns over 5G technology emanating from China. How would you respond to those? Uh, the application for new technology will certainly bring many new issues. And these issues include security issues, like what have talked about. And the 5G network will certainly give rise to more complex and more severe security issues. But these issues, for equipment producers like us, for the developers, we have to solve them. We're doing this to solve this problem, these problems. And ZTE in Belgium and uh, Italy and in China, we have our s specific security labs engaged in solving the security issue in the application of 5G network. Of course, in this process, there will be other problems. And in the whole process of using it, there will be new, more complex issues that will crop up. Personally, I believe that in the process of using new technologies, these problems will be solved. Okay, we only have a couple of minutes left, uh, so I would like to end on a, uh, a broader question, which is we've been very focused on the competition between two geopolitical powers when it comes to expressing this new technology. What role does the consumer actually play here? Can the consumer sway the, uh, the outcome of, of who wins in the 5G race? And I open this up to all the panelists, whoever wants to take it first. Well, I think the consumer will depend on the experience he has from his uh, mobile provider. And I think, so it's really one level removed from that. So if I use a mobile operator who gives me better service, mixed reality, virtual reality, downloading a movie in two seconds or whatever, uh, I'll go by that, and whether, whether inside his network, what equipment he uses, I think, will be left to the network providers and all these geopolitical issues. Mm. Sanjay? As far as I'm concerned, I don't think 5G is about one country or one region winning over the other. I think 5G will be ubiquitous, and 5G will be not just about consumer, it will be about businesses, it will be about all verticals, and it is going to happen over the course of next several years to the benefit of all humans. Mm -hmm. It will, I think, provide tremendous benefit to the emerging economies, the underdeveloped part of the countries as well, because it will really be able to bring the full benefit of data to the advancement of infrastructure in those countries. So I think it will be bringing benefit to consumers across the globe. It's not about 
any one part winning or other. Of course, it will be a multi-year cycle. Mm. This is just the start. It's going to be transformative over the next 10 years. I think it will be great for the planet. And Li Zishui, you get the last word. Very quickly, what role does the consumer play here? The consumers will certainly use it. They will use convenient and uh, low-cost products that are in their interest. So whether it's the equipment provider, parts provider, or network provider, so long as they can meet the consumer need in this regard, they will do well. Okay. I think that's a good place to end it. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and thank you so much to our panelists for having an open discussion on what is quite a sensitive topic at the moment. So thank you.